just uh, going to talk some more about Jackson Pollock today. Um, <laughs> you know, they feel steeped in Jackson Pollock. But one of the things, you know, part, I guess I should say, you know, part of talking about Pollock allows us to look at his work and, you know, figure out what he's doing. But also keep in mind that um, he's an artist who becomes uh, really significant um, fairly quickly. And so by focusing so much on his work, we're also... Talk, we're also really putting him into the context of the time in terms of critics who are talking about his work, public re reception, and then, as we'll see today, um, some um, controversies uh, that developed as well that he's a part of, but certainly, you know, he's, he, um, you know, he's, not, the, he's not the only one. So we'll talk more about Pauling today. We'll talk about some of these other issues. And then um, on Friday, we'll talk about some of the, many of the other abstract expressionists and we'll, we'll move away from this gestural abstraction and towards a, a variation of abstract expressionism that's known as color field. So it's kind of like there's two different trends um, within this general, general heading. Um, I think we looked up last time. Did we, look at, did we look at this one last time? We were on the, we were, okay, we got to this point. Um, when we come to number 30, Autumn Rhythm um, from 1950, um, what we're seeing here is the, the um, work that really we think about work being canonical for Pollock, or work that's probably being like his best known work, it, you know, it's work such as this, where it's the all over, again, we're seeing more of the all over style painting, but it moves away from anything, you know, representational at all. I mean, even this, pre you know, this previous work, uh, if we go back to here, this is also one of those all over paintings, but those handprints, even though like, representational maybe isn't the right word for it, but as I talked about last time, those handprints, um, you know, are you know literally a representation, you know, of the human hand, you know, of the artist. Um, you know, we get through a wax poetic and, and talk about this, you know, link back to the past and archetypes and so on. But it's when you move to this work here that even that is, uh, you know, certainly that is eliminated. Um, but as we also, but as I mentioned last time too, but there sometimes you do find ephemera in the paintings, like ashes and cigarette butts. Um, and some of these works, he, he, he purposefully um, sometimes put objects on the canvas before he started painting, like things like washers and nuts and that kind of thing. So sometimes there are some objects embedded in there, but they're, they're, but they're almost impossible to see in reproductions. They're, they're sometimes difficult to see in, um, you know, even when you're standing in front of a painting and, and looking at them directly. So one of the things um, about these works, and this is one of the things, that, or this, you know, this run of works that he has, uh, that's often talked about is that, and I think it's important to understand, is the fact that um, he's working with the canvas on the floor. So here you can see he's in his studio. He's got um, a work that's up on the wall, but when he's working, you, know, you can see the roll of canvas here. He's unrolled it. And it allows him to work around all of the edges of the painting. And I think I mentioned last time about how with some of his works, it's a little unclear as to which way you should hang them. Um, because you, because not all of them are signed, um, and he shifts from signing the paintings on the front um, to you know signing them on the back, and then some of them won't sign. Um, so with the signature, there's always an assumption you're going to orient the work to the signature. But when there's no signature, and if you don't have any documentation or if there's no photograph, you know, of his studio or the work in the studio. Uh, to where you can compare the way he was, you know, hanging it um, in his space, then there's been um, some conjecture. And most recently, I've forgotten which museum it was, most recently there was a museum um, that had announced that they were going to rotate one of their Pollock paintings because they'd come across some information. And I think it may have been a, a, you know, a photograph from the 1950s that showed the painting, you know, flipped the other way around. And so they realized, oh, we must have been hanging this thing wrong, so they flipped it. Um, you know, kind of, you know, flipped it around. So, but, you know, I think the, you know, the point is moot in a lot of ways because, you know, the work hangs the, on the wall, but that's, you know, that's really not certainly how Pollock would have seen it, you know, while he was creating it. And it was important for him to have that kind of access. This is a, um, there's a series of photographs of Pollock painting um, that are very well known, um, this being one of them. But you can see how he's literally, you know, getting into the painting. You know, he's not staying, you know, totally on the edges of it. He's, you know, he literally steps into it. The canvases or the um, paintings themselves become become really, really large. Um, the photographer who shot the um, the series of photographs, his name's Hans Namath, he also shot some film. And this is, is well known. You may have seen it before. I've seen it in um, pretty commonly. It, it'll be shown in museums. Um, it has this kind of... Um, 
soundtrack to it that kind of, you know, it's almost like uh, fingernails on a chalkboard in a way. It's not maybe that bad, but I, I'm, every time I hear it, I'm like, oh. Um, but it's just a couple minutes long, and I thought it'd be useful to go ahead and watch it because it shows Pollock painting, and then you hear him. Um, he's basically reading a prepared statement, kind of like an artist statement, and so you get you're getting information directly from the artist, you know, about how he works and you know what he's thinking. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that I think what often surprises people when they hear Pollock's voice, because when you see photographs of him and he's like this, you know, raw, you know, kind of tough guy, but when he speaks, his voice is is not as you know deep and you know, it's not this baritone voice necessarily. Um, and because he's reading, his voice is really flat too. So for those of you who may have to like do an artist talk soon or, you know, read a prepared statement, you know, for, um, say one of the BFA seminars or something, keep that in mind. There's, when, when people read, uh, from a paper, they tend to just become really monotone and it's, it's not, it, it's harder to listen to, but, uh, but Pollock did it, right? <clears throat> I home is in spring, East Hampton, Long Island. I was born in Cody, Wyoming, 39 years ago. In New York, I spent two years at the Art Students League with Tom Benton. He was a strong personality to react against. This was in 1929. I don't work from drawings or color sketches. My pain is direct. I usually paint on the floor. I enjoy working on a large canvas. I feel more at home, more at ease in a big area. Having the canvas on the floor, I feel nearer, more of a part of the painting. This way I can walk around it, work from all four sides, and be in the painting. Similar to the Indian sand painters of the West. Sometimes I use a brush, but often prefer using a stick. Sometimes I pour the paint straight out of the can. I like to use a dripping fluid paint. I also use sand, broken glass, petals, string. A method of painting is the natural growth out of a need. I want to express my feelings rather than illustrate them. Technique is just a means of arriving at a statement. When I am painting, I have a general notion as to what I am about. I can control the flow of the paint. There is no accident. That is, there is no beginning and no end. Sometimes I lose the pain. But I have no fear of changes, of destroying the image. Because the painting has a life of its own, I try to let it live. <laughs>
Thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, oh. Uh, <laughs> Screechy violins. <laughs> so what do you take away from this? Like, what are your, what are your thoughts on, you know, his, what he's saying? Maybe, you know, what he's doing? I think it's really good that he said, it, uh, I forgot exactly what he said, mm-hmm. but something about how he uh, draws from his emotions. Did I feel that way sometimes? Yeah, that he's not trying to illustrate something, but he's expressing his emotions, right? So if we think about this, like one of the, the core ideas of abstract expressions, and then this is, one of the, again, one of the things that, you know, Greenberg you know, really articulated was that this kind of work could, um, you know, it didn't have subject matter, but it could have content, and that's, you know, essentially what Pauli is, is talking about there. Yeah. Another thing that he was saying that kind of struck me was that there were no accidents or mistakes and that a painting has a life of its, of its own, so he mm-hmm. tries to let it yeah, yeah, and that, I think it's an interesting idea. Do you uh, does it what uh, what why can you artic- articulate why you respond to that? It's just an interesting idea, or do you feel like you're you have connections I, to that I, with your own work? Interesting or? idea because I know me personally, I worry about making mistakes in my art all the time. Mm-hmm. So to know that he's not worried about if something doesn't happen exactly how he thought it would, he just kind of does it and. Mm-hmm. Enjoys the end result. Yeah. What yeah. And I think I think it takes time to get there because I mean, you consider you know this is this film um, you know this came twenty fifty and this film shot exactly what or twenty fifty one and but he's been working since the late twenties you know as an artist so he's really a student in the late twenties kind of coming into his own more in the thirties so he's, he's been working you know for a while and it and it. Um, that it's not the kind of thing you get to overnight, right? I think there's a kind of acceptance of process or developing that process. You know, that process. But yeah, I think that's good. Aubrey, did you have a comment? Maybe I just saw your, saw your hand. Yeah. <laughs> All right. um, anything else? Questions? Comments? Does this, does the film, uh, or this little film, affect your way of thinking about how these paintings are made at all? I mean, some of you may have seen it, possibly have seen this before. Yes, no. Well, I mean, maybe it's just because we've been on Paul for like almost three days. No, yeah, I, know. I think yeah. like I've I've heard all these ideas mm-hmm. that he just said before. Mm-hmm. Like it seems kind of like okay, but is there no more depth? Not that like I don't enjoy mm-hmm. the paintings, but like it's just so simple. But I, I think we've heard so many ideas from like the the people that have been reviewing his work and like. That it's just kind of, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's more, well, yeah, maybe it's not, it's, not, it's less challenging, maybe, or it's, you're more comfortable with it. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a really good, um, you know, really good point. I think that, you know, because sometimes, um, and actually, it's a good, probably a good point to move forward, too, um, because sometimes people think about this idea that, you know, there's so much chaos, you know, that's in his work, and uh, we'll come back to, the, you know, this idea of chaos, but when you see that, um, the way that he's working is really methodical. You know, in a lot of ways, and you kind of see the pattern, um, you know, and the, and the movement. Uh, another thing about Paul too is that when he's when he's often talked about, he's talked about as this individual, and a part that really you know connects with this again this American you know myth of the the rugged individual and these artists who are you know and Greenberg really promoting this idea that there's all these artists who are you know doing their own thing and they're working in isolation and they're alienated and so on. But even in that little film snippet, you know, Pollock makes a reference to um, Native American sand painters, which we'll talk about. And a huge influence on Pollock was um, the Mexican muralist David Siqueiros. And Siqueiros, um, you know, certainly he's, you know, he's working in Mexico, he's, you know, you know, large career in Mexico. But he also spent time in the United States, and he spent, he um, actually ran a workshop an experimental um, painting workshop um, in New York in the let's say it was the, it was like the late 20s or the early 1930s, and Pollock had experience there. So a huge influence on Pollock and other artists um, it is the Kedos and Mexican you know, muralism or that, you know, that um, in general. Uh, an example, one of, one of Siqueiros' probably best-known um, paintings is this one here. It's called Portrait of the, of the Bourgeoisie. 
And um, it's, a little, it's hard to photograph because it is in a stairwell. So if you look carefully, you, know, you walk down the stairs. This is, a, this is one wall here. This is the back wall. And then here's the side wall. So the corners are essentially here and there. So as you, you're literally walking into the, the space of the painting in a way. So, I mean, on one hand, it's, uh, it's sort of like a typical, you know, two-dimensional painting as if it's, you know, wrapped, you know, into, into the, you know, the three sections or the three walls. But the way that you would experience the painting is it's almost as if you enter into that space, which I think is significant. You think about, you know, Paul talking about you know, going into the space. There's also, uh, you know, it's very representational. This is basically uh, making references to uh, contemporary society and issues and, um, you know, uh, growing militarism and, you know, abuse, you know, abusive situations with institutions, you know, real institutions and so on. So uh, it's a painting that's kind of typical of its time in terms of being, you know, being made in the 1930s and being very representational. But Siqueiros also... Um, created works that were very abstract as well. And so we can see this, you know, kind of an abstract expressionist quality as well. This is, um, it's an unfinished mural, so it's, it's very, um, it's close, but you can see there's areas like um, this area here is was incomplete, so it was incomplete at the time of his death. Um, this is a mural that he did in Mexico at the School of the, School of the Fine Arts at San Miguel de Allende. Uh, and um, I include this because you kind of offer you know some some balance between more representational work by Siqueiros and this more abstract work. But especially that Siqueiros was really interested in murals and three dimensional spaces. He you know he certainly did some flat murals. He did a lot of there's just you know flat murals on the wall. But this idea of space and and the painting becoming three D space I think is significant. Um, Pollock never goes that direction, but he does talk about this idea of you know being in the space of the painting or kind of imagining what that would be like. Uh, the other thing about Sikhaos too that's um, you know certainly influential on Pollock and, and and every other artist uh, who has an interest in the material is that um, he uh, helps to develop. He wasn't the only person working on it. He was working with uh, the company that was manufacturing it, um, but he helped to develop one of the first um, commercial latex paints, which is called Duco, it's C-U-C-O. Um, Siqueiros was interested in it because as a muralist working in a country that's really hot and humid, um, if, you used, if you used more you know, traditional media um, in that environment, they tended to degrade really quickly. And latex paints offered a, you know, a kind of paint that was more um, weather resistant. And interestingly, when you know Pollock you know, begins um, painting this method, he's using latex paint, you know, because of the the um, he's using house paints and basically, um, but because of the textures, you know, the kind of liquid um, you know quality um, to them. So I think it's really important to talk about Sikhenos and this influence, you know, certainly on Pollock, but on abstract expressionism in general, because oftentimes it's, it's not acknowledged. And uh, the other thing about Sikhenos's workshops and. Um, New York City is he encouraged students to drip and splatter and and um, you know work with paint uh, in very non-traditional ways you know not not um, just uh, with a brush so we can you know, certainly I think see um, see that influence um, another thing that Pollock um, talks about oh I forgot I had this quote here um, one of the things that Sikio has wanted is he thought that uh, modern art should be um, or you know, contemporary art should be mon monumental, heroic, and public art. So his ideas are a little different than Pollock's, but this idea of this monumental quality or heroic quality we see in Pollock's work. But as we see, as we begin to shift to talking about other abstract expressionists, um, this idea of being monumental, heroic, big, and so on, whether it works or it fails, um, or you know, somewhere in between, um, th those ideas are often embedded in work and embedded in, in abstract expressionism itself. Um, Paul is also influenced by uh, Navajo sand painting, and that's what he references in that little film. Does anybody know about sand painting? Does that have any experience of it or seen it? Carly, you're kind of like, <coughs> yes or no? What does it evoke for you? What do you, what do you know about it? I'm not sure you can name it. That they like create them. There are, um, yeah, and these are very similar. If you think of the um, the, mandala, the sand paintings of mandalas by Tibetan monks, 
it's a it's a it's a similar kind of process actually in a lot of ways. Um, Pollock was a, was aware of this. He had seen um, some sand uh, painters uh, creating these images. If you travel in the Southwest, you can um, find these like little tourist things all the time. They're usually like sand that's glued to a board and a frame. Um, you know, it looks uh, something like this. So most people's experience is of uh, sand paintings is in that form where they these objects um, that can be you know bought and sold and hung on the wall. But not only sand painting is part of a ritual process. So um, they're created um, as, as in some cases they're created for individuals and specific um, you know you know who have a specific problem or issue that's trying to be resolved through an issue. There are also some standard rituals in which you would create a sand painting. So it's done, um, and what you're seeing, it's all hard to see because the photograph is so dark. Um, this is a, a person creating one. He's in a hogan, which is a, um, a, a wood, like wooden beam structure. He's actually working on um, the floor here, and so he's got the you know the surface that he's got, you know, kind of clean, fresh sand. He's created this very smooth surface, and the pattern that you see here is made um, with sand of different colors, so you can see that there are some bowls here, and literally, you know, it's being made by, you know, guiding or dropping the sand onto that surface, so they're very, very precise, um, and it takes a lot of control and a lot of practice to be able to make these images, and they're done in a, as a kind of meditative process in a way, so they're, so the creation of the image is, you know, is the ritual to a certain sense, or is a part of a part of the ritual itself. So you go into that space, and it's one of the reasons that Pollock was also interested in sand paintings because the process of painting for him, in some ways, was like you know, going into that space of creating the painting. Again, keep in mind he's interested in these in archetypes and um, you know, it's undergoing you know, psych, you know, psychoanalytic union analysis and so on, so it's bringing all of these, these ideas into play. I think when you look at the work in its final state, you know, you don't necessarily um, you know, realize that or see that, but it's, it's, it's influencing him in that process. In um, 1948, the Museum of Modern Art acquires um, two paintings, um, one by, well, I'll show them the other things too, right? Um, but they, these are two paintings that they acquired. Um, one is the painting that Pollock does in 1948, and the other one on the right um, is a very famous painting by Andrew Wyeth um, called Christina's World. Is Wyeth somebody that you're familiar with at all? Is that, or, the, or this painting even itself? Um, how many of you have seen this painting before? It looks familiar to you. Um, when you. What do you think about this painting? How does it strike you? Has anybody seen it in person? Yeah. <coughs> Where is it at? Is it? It's at Boma. It's in Boma. It's at Boma. Is it huge? It's pretty good size. It's not. It's like, if I remember, it's like you know, three, four feet across. Maybe. It's been a while since I've seen it. So that's something that has some. So does Wyeth ring a bell at all? Does mean anything about Wyeth? He's a, a painter from the Northeast. If I remember correctly, he's a generally associated with Maine. And um, and actually, I was in Maine a couple of years ago, and and in the area where he lived, um, the friend I was staying with actually knows the Wyeth family, which was kind of strange. And she she happened to point out, like, oh, yeah, the Wyeths live over, you know, that way. And um, because whenever I've seen this painting before, this image before, I've always thought of it as the Midwest, you know, like a grain field or something. And then um, we were... We we're like actually very close to the coast, and there's all of these salt marshes and this grass that grows in these salt marshes, and then the color looks just like that. And I was like, oh, and then you know, kind of put that, put this painting into, um, you know, into you know, literally into a different context. Um, so it's actually you know connected, you know, to a very particular place in the landscape around um, Wyatt's home. Um, Wyatt is an is an interesting artist during this time period because. He's really a kind of a foil in a lot of ways to the um, to these, these abstract trends, and the, his method of painting is really traditional. Um, most of his works are tempera, um, egg tempera, so that really um, meticulous you know, method of painting. When you see his works in, in person, um, you really you know they're, you can really see how meticulously they're crafted. They're kind of they're really the antithesis of Pollock, who's you know, guiding and dripping, you know, the paint onto the surface. Um, he's, you know, rarely actually touching, you know, the surface, you know, with the tip of the brush 
or stick or whatever it is um, that he's using, and you look at why it's painting, and you see all of these meticulous little you know brush strokes and, and margins and so on. So I think it's very interesting that you know MoMA in 1948 you know acquires both of these paintings because one uh, represents you know this kind of traditional type of painting that's that's still present and active. Uh, and I think that's important to keep in mind that we're talking, you know, so much about these movements that are, you know, avant-garde and cutting edge and, you know, kind of pushing, you know, what what is acceptable art or, or even considered to be good art uh, forward uh, or, you know, into the future, I guess. Um, but there are still artists working in very you know, um, traditional manner who are also, you know, receiving a lot of attention. Um, the other reason why I show you these um, two paintings side by side, too, is because um, the museum, and they, I think they still do this, too, but the museum <coughs> often will poll visitors to find out, you know, what's your most, you know, you know, favorite work. I think they do it out of curiosity with a little PR, you know, stuff about that. And in 1948, um, Wyatt's painting was the, the most, fa you know, favored painting. Uh, or the most popular, you know, painting among uh, museum visitors, and not Pollux, which, which I think is intriguing because when you're looking at the magazine and reading magazines and reading the reviews and so on, it's this kind of work that's getting really written about a lot, and not so much, you know, um, why there are other artists uh, working in this. So what what's really relevant, sort of, in the art world, or seen as hot and new in the art world, is things a little bit different in terms of what's in, embraced um, by the public. I'm curious, before we move away from this, this uh, painting by Wyatt, how do you interpret this painting? Do you know it? Have you, because some of you know a little bit about it or you've seen it before. What's the mood or how does it make you feel? It's creepy? It's creepy? Sad? Yeah, in what way? Her hand's not quite on the ground. Yeah, I feel it carefully. There's a shadow um, under her hand. There's an old Terence Malick movie called Days of Heaven, and he mm -hmm. used several Andrew Wyatt paintings to inspire the cinematography. And oh, interesting. The best scene in the movie is when the actress, you know, he poses her exactly like that, and then got a house that looked almost exactly like that. Oh, that's interesting. And what's the tone of the scene here? It, it's what, isolation. Is it isolation? No, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I presumably think I know that film, but I don't know that I've seen it. Any other thoughts, feelings? She's woken up in it, but not really there. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's something a little other world yeah. about yeah. it. Yeah, it's very evocative. I, I found that some people, um, you know, look at this painting in a kind of romantic way, you know, sort of in, you know, and romantic, not, you know, like in romance, but, you know, because it, it evokes, you know, feelings and emotions. Um, and when you know the background of the, of the painting, I think it's even more um, poignant. Um, apparently, one of Wyatt's neighbors, this is a portrait in the sense of, or represents one of his neighbors, and she had polio, and she was also, you know, didn't have a lot of money, so she didn't have any kind of conveyance, like a wheelchair or anything. Uh, and so she, you know, because she had polio um, as a child, she didn't have use of her legs. And so she literally just had crawled around. That was how she you know, got from one place to another. And so this was a, a painting about her, like this was her, you know, you know Away from the house, going you know, kind of back to the house, uh, and so yeah, I think when you know that it's like, oh, you know, it's really you know, it even sort of tugs at the, the heartstrings even more. I almost wish I didn't know that. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. That's not like anything to your father's for. It's just, yeah, I, I, I think every time I've seen it, I've always thought it seems very otherworldly, mm -hmm. or maybe she's been dropped off somewhere that she doesn't know, and then, and now that it's just like, oh, what. A, yeah, I know it's like oh, oh, damn book. Yeah, yeah, it's really it's, skinny. It's emotional. Yeah, and you realize that too. You realize that she doesn't have a lot of uh, muscle fat. Yeah, yeah in fact, like, cause she's like so thin. Like it almost gives her a youthful feel. Mm -hmm. Like she's a child in the yeah, and she's not. environment. Yeah, yeah, and she's a I mean, she's a young woman, but not a not a child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think I think knowing that you know sort of you know could really change it. Quite a so it's a so it's a painting that you know really the subject matter I think is significant and the subject matter um, and the, you know really kind of prompts and emotions we very so they very different um, from Pollock's work. The um, the other thing is we also talk more about the context of the time 
And, and again, well, it, well, this is, you know, that's Pollock, but we'll take it a little bit um, broader than that as well. In 1949, there's a, a famous uh, magazine article um, about Pollock that was um, published uh, in Life magazine. And, you know, this really nice, you know, layout here. So he's um, where he's, you know, standing, you know, leaning against one of these uh, paintings. very similar to the one that, uh, you know, it's long and narrow um, in that the little film snippet. And I think it's interesting that the title of this is Jackson Pollock, Is He the Greatest Living Painter in the United States? It's a question mark, you know, as opposed to a statement, um, you know, which is interesting. And it's a pretty short spread. It really focuses more on the image, his images and some text. Um, but what was really notable about this is Life Magazine was a really popular magazine. Um, it was, um, you know, something that was like kind of a newsstand all across the United States. Um, it was a, it was really for a very, you know, a, a generalized audience in a sense. So um, Life Magazine, Time Magazine uh, were both very um, similar. You know, in some ways it would function, uh, maybe not as intensely, but in some ways similar to the internet, right? You go to the internet and you can skim through things, or you go into Facebook and you see all these things that people are interested in, posting you know, stuff. These magazines, I think, in some ways were similar because they had lots of articles on different topics, like um, international events and news, um, you know, more you know, uh, domestic and regional kinds of things, you know, very serious you know, articles about serious issues. Um, light-hearted things, you know, stuff about, you know, culture, you know, um, you know music, theater, you know, art, and so on. So they're really this, you know, kind of, you know, they have, they spoke to a really um, broad audience. The reason I emphasize that is because when this article is published, it's certainly promoting Pollock and bringing Pollock to, you know, kind of broader, you know, American recognition, but it's also bringing abstract expressionism, you know, to that level as well. So it's really, um, really the, the, uh, two, um, the two go hand in hand. In hand. So, uh, so you talk about 1949 as being, um, you know, really significant, you know, not just for Pollock, but for um, the abstract expressionists in general. In Time Magazine, the next year, there's a, um, an article about it, sort of kind of a review of his work, and this is a, a quote um, and from the writer. He says, you know, it is easy to detect the following thing in all of his paintings, chaos, absolute lack of harmony, complete lack of structural organization, Total absence of technique, however rudimentary, once again, chaos. You know, the exact opposite of Wyatt, maybe is one way of thinking about it. Uh, and interestingly, when Pollock read the article, he sent a telegram to the magazine uh, that just said this, no chaos, damn it. Which <laughs> I think is kind of funny. Um, because they, you know, they tend to get interpreted that way, but that's, that was, was never, um, you know, never his intention. Uh, I kind of like that short, I guess we could call it sending an email you know, to somebody. Uh, after uh, they've just published something, the uh, the other thing that really helped to bring the um, the abstract expressionists in general, a lot of the ones are pictured here. We'll talk about them uh, more on uh, Friday and also on Monday too. Um, are uh, they became they refer to themselves in having to do this thing that happens that we'll talk about uh, as the irascibles. And uh, so they're, they were kind of presenting themselves as argumentative, is uh, maybe one way of thinking about it. This is a, a photograph that was produced for Life magazine in 1951 for an article. And so we see a group of them here. There's a, a couple of artists who are, are part of the abstract expressionists, or considered a part of them, who weren't, um, weren't present. And the, the reason that this photograph was uh, taken was to talk about an issue um, having to do with the Metropolitan Museum and the Whitney Museum. And the Metropolitan Museum of Art is a huge collection um, in New York City. It um, really encompasses everything. I mean, that's always sort of been their goal. Uh, so they've got ancient art, you know, in the Western tradition, uh, ancient art in the Eastern tradition, and pretty much, you know, everything forward. They're like your kind of classic, you know, broad, you know, spectrum art museum. Uh, really putting a lot of emphasis on the you know, ancient work, you know, medieval, you know, the Renaissance, you know, and so on. Um, the, at this time, their collection in modern and contemporary, you know, wasn't as significant as this today. It's larger today. Um, the Whitney Museum was set up uh, specifically to focus on American art. Um, it also is within this time, you know, frame kind of mid-century that we see the Guggenheim Museum, uh, which also focuses on modern and contemporary art. Um, 
you know, as well. But but the Whitney and the Metropolitan have had this agreement that the um, the Whitney would collect, you know, and show American artists, especially a lot of contemporary artists, uh, and the Metropolitan would focus more on what they you know um, termed classic art. And that wasn't really tr- true through the 1930s. And then after that, um, that that sort of agreement they had, they stopped following. It kind of you know kind of broke it. it was sort of a it wasn't not so much an official policy as a, a as a kind of informal agreement. And the Metropolitan um, decided to host, and, and so there was some kind of infighting going on. But the Metropolitan decided to. to basically sponsor an exhibition of like new American artists, so contemporary American art. And they um, basically had uh, curators in various parts of the United States, so kind of West Coast, Midwest, East Coast, you know, New York in particular, who were basically acting as scouts uh, and you know, just kind of determining you know, who you know, would be juried into the show or who was going to be a part of this really big, significant show. Uh, the group of artists that we think of today as the abstract expressionists were really upset when they began to hear who was in the show because they felt that um, abstract expressionism basically was getting left out. And keep in mind that in this, in, in this you know, time frame, with the abstract expressionism isn't really a phrase that's caught on yet. So we use the term, but they weren't using it so much. So they, so basically they protested, and um, Life Magazine ran an article about the about the protest and the and the, and the show, um, as it turned out. And this is the photograph um, that they um, they shot to um, go with it. So this is the letter um, that they wrote. They all signed um, down below here, uh, and it's it's a little hard to it's a little fuzzy, but it says, you know, dear sir, the underside painters. Um, reject, I love this phrasing, reject the monster national exhibition to be held at the Metropolitan Museum of Art next December and will not submit work to the jury. So basically what they said is that, you know, we don't like your jurors, we don't like the kind of work that you're likely to um, put in this show and, and we're just not going to participate in it. Uh, the organization of the exhibition and the choice of jurors by Francis Henry Taylor and Robert Beverly Hale the Metropolitan's director and the associate curator of American art does not warrant any hope that a just proportion of advanced art will be included. Um, we draw to the attention of those gentlemen the historical fact that for roughly a hundred years, only advanced art has made any consequential contribution to civilization. Right? That's a strong language. Uh, Mr. Taylor, on more than one occasion, has publicly declared his contempt for modern painting. Mr. Hale, in attempting to jury notori- uh, sorry, attempting a jury notoriously hostile to advanced art, takes his place beside Mr. Tyler. We believe that all the advanced artists of America will join us in our stand. And then you see a list of names here. And these are the names generally considered to be the abstract expressionists. Um, and the following sculptors support the stand. And then you see a list of um, significant artists there as well. So they're, basically what they were doing was kind of, um, in a lot of ways, like throwing down the gauntlet and saying, you know, look, you're, you're just showing this, you know, um, work that doesn't represent um, the new, and they're also saying the best work um, as well. Um, this phrase advanced art is commonly used. I think you certainly saw it in Greenberg's writing. Um, it's the language of the time. When they say advanced art, it's what we would think of. It's when we tend to use the phrase contemporary art. Um, but... That phrasing contemporary art is, you know, the way we use it today is really broad, you know, and this phrasing of advanced art implies that it's better, right? It's more advanced, it's the good stuff, it's what's, you know, leading the pack in that respect. And so I think that language is, um, you know, certainly really significant. Um, what do you think about this? What do you think about this situation? Is this a good strategy? It seems very clicky. It seems what? Clicky. Clicky, it is totally clicky. Yeah. Yeah. Describing themselves as advanced artists, like it seems like so, like they're looking down their noses at them through this lens. Yeah. What's up? Fresh. I said you can't sit with us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very elitist in a way, right? And the interesting thing too is that they all, you know, they all, you know, dressed up a little more formally, you know, certainly. You know, when you see images of the artists, you know, working in studios and so on, they're like, you know, grand artists. Um, and there's some, I'm trying, I can't remember who made this comment, but there was a, um, someone, somebody who went in writing about this, 
mean, it's common that they look like bankers, you know, more than <laughs> contemporary artists, right? So, I mean, they're trying to say, you know, we're advanced artists and we're, you know, avant-garde and all of that, but they come across, you know, as looking very, um, you know, very conservative uh, in that in respect. And, and this photograph, and this photograph becomes like the photograph. There's a, a book that was published in 1970. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I should remember, a uh, very famous art historian, but it's, it's the book that was like, if you studied, if you studied this time frame, it was the book that, you know, especially abstract expression, it was the one you would read, it was the one that everybody, you know, responded to, and this was the photograph on the cover. So this really becomes this, like, canonical image of uh, who these artists are, but it's very quirky, I think, in a, a lot of ways. The other thing about it, too, is that you'll notice that there's one woman... Uh, standing here in the back, and she's actually standing up on a ladder. Um, in later years, and, the, and her name is um, Hedda Stern, so her, her name is listed here somewhere in that list. She, um, in an interview in the 1980s, she um, talked about how she was late to the photo shoot, um, and so that's part of the reason why she was in the back, and because she wasn't as tall as the as the guy standing in the back, the photographer had her stand up on a ladder. Um, and apparently the abstract expressionists hated that, this group of, you know, macho men. Um, because you, I find that when you look at this image, you tend, you tend to keep looking at her, right? And she's sort of in the back and up above. Um, they, and part of it, too, was they didn't want her being there. They did not want a woman in the photo shoot, even though there was some women associated, you know, with this, you know, general movement. And their reason for that, I mean, this is really terrible, but their reason for it was they felt that if there was a woman present, it wouldn't be taken seriously. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's an illustration of the attitudes of the time, and even um, that Hedda Stern didn't didn't want to be there. But the reason she was there was that her um, she had gallery representation, and the um, gallery owner, or the the gallerist that represented her also represented several of the other artists, and she wanted her in the photo shoot with her other with her other you know, with her stable of artists, basically. So she was the one that made that demand, otherwise she probably wouldn't have gone. And in that interview in the 80s, she said that, um, that she, she wished she hadn't. She said it was a really kind of, an awful, um, kind of an awful situation and an awful dynamic. She's an artist who often doesn't get talked about, so I thought, and we'll conclude with this image here, so I thought it would be worthwhile to look at her work. This is one of her, you know, kind of a good example of her work from around this time period. Um, and she's an artist who's really combining, you know, abstract trends and abstraction um, with representation. So when you look at a work such as this, you, you see structures that seem, you know, reminiscent, like bridges or buildings or three-dimensional shapes, but yet it's, um, you know, kind of really abstract and very, um, you know, certainly very flattened in nature. Um, it's not so much gestural abstraction. It's kind of, it's kind of in between gestural abstraction and color field uh, in some ways with these flat areas and, and box of color. So I think, you know, just looking at this image really briefly also makes a nice transition to where we'll go on Friday, which is away from color. <laughs> and uh, we'll start talking about the color field painters and the other variation of abstract expressionism. Uh, also really, uh, we're, we've got one more minute. I want to show you something really quickly. Um, there's an assignment. I'd like you to think about this show that was so controversial and what did get shown in the politics of the time. Um, what did get shown versus the um, the abstract expressionist? I'll open this here. If you go to the blog, I've got the assignment here. It's abstract. It says abstract expressionism in Life magazine. There's a link to the Pollock article. There's a link to the article that um, had this you know famous photograph in there. Uh, if you click on the links in blue, it'll take you to where you can read the articles. And what I'd like you to do, and you do this for Monday, not Friday. Um, is take a look at both of those articles and the language of the well, the language of the article on Pollock, and then the images of the work that actually gets into the show uh, and uh, in the uh, at the Metropolitan Museum. Respond to these questions. Make it due on Monday. And if you have problems reading the Pollock article because the text is a little blurry when you open it, if you click on that link, there's um, the, it'll it'll open to something that's a little bit easier to read. So have a look at that. If you have questions or problems with it, let me know on Friday. All right, have a good rest of the day.